All right, you lot, yep, guess who is back? It's me, Reedy, with the momentous 50th episode of Beat the First Man. To celebrate, you have three brand new features to get stuck into. The lineal European Cups make a return. Jay Tennant joins us on Zooming In. And find out why I'm holding a giant inflatable hammer. What is more to like... The English football season starts tonight. I'm recording this on Friday, so the only thing for it is roll the titles. Here we are then, episode 50 has arrived people, what better way to celebrate, I thought I'd go all out with some Poundland Pyro. Yeah, I couldn't afford the real thing, and I film it indoors, I'm not being funny, you can't be letting off Pyro in a bedroom can I, it's going to go terribly terribly wrong. So if you are a regular to the show, thank you so much for being part of the journey, it's been incredible from episode one to get to where we are now the difference if you want to laugh go back and watch episode one where yeah I, god how people stay with it after that i'll never know but here we are episode 50 has come a long way uh, so if you are new to the show what we would love you to do is to click the subscribe down below that's very very important don't forget to ring the little bell um so that you never miss another episode now guys on the last one i set you a challenge of giving 10 likes for the last episode we got seven, so we nearly got there. So this time, it's the 50th episode, come on. We want 10, we want 10, we want 10. So 10 likes, come on guys. All, I mean, not being funny, I don't ask you to do much. Just click a little button that's got a little thumbs up. It's not too difficult, I don't ask that much. Anyway, let's get on with the show. So I told you before, there's new features coming later, but <clears throat> helmet time can only mean one thing, Stoke Gabriel and Torbay please. Enough of that. Let's turn the little light off. Save the batteries, let's be tight. Um, so the Stoke Gabriel shirt from last season is back on and it can all mean one thing, the season starts tomorrow for real. They've had friendlies, they've had kickabouts, they've had training, blah, 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 blah. But as of today, Saturday, when this goes out, it is the first competitive game of Stoke Gabriel and Torbay Police FC. They entertain uh, Plymouth Mahon. I don't want to pronounce it wrong after the pronunciation police got me last time. So Mahon, not Marjon. Um, it's a massive occasion for the, for the club. You know, it's their first ever game as this newly merged club. So we wish them all the best. Obviously, we are massively right behind it. So after all the trials and tribulations of the season, wouldn't it be brilliant if they could win today and kick the season off and start with a 100% record? It, it'd be amazing. So I think what we all need, we all need something to lift our spirits before kickoff. So this is going out at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. The game kicks off at 3. Jimmy, have you got some words to lighten the mood? Oi, oi, it's the Bulldog. Massive congratulations to Stoke Gabriel and Torby, Pol Torby Police, sorry, football club on your merger. What the bloody hell does that mean? Anyway, best wishes in particular to the youth section. The future's bright, people. Keep working hard, and I'm sure you'll go from strength to strength. Good luck. It's the Bulldog. Let's have it. Yes, Jimmy Bullard. There he is. If that's not got you in the mood for this afternoon, boys, go for it. Bring the points home, and we will celebrate next Saturday. And next weekend, I am delighted to announce, after months of promising it, mid Table Gary, the chairman, will be on the show. 
There we go. So you've got that to look forward to next week, people. Mid-table Gary Page, the chairman of Stoke Gabriel and Torbay Police, who famously, after they'd lost their first 13 games, said he still thought they could finish mid-table. He's on the show next week. So I'm looking forward to that. He's been a great sport, and I'm looking forward to him coming on. Anyway, we all know you've missed it. Come on, you know you've missed it too. How old? So the game where, quite simply, I put up the photo of an old footballer. All you've got to do is guess how old they were when it was taken. So we're heading back to Italy, and I've got a feeling they're beginning to challenge Scotland as the home of ageing footballers. So uh, this player, he was very, he had 11 clubs during his career. Um, his career spanned with the domestic game over there with spells at Foggia, Parma, Prato, Mantova, Navarra, amongst others. Um, his career, although solid, it never graced the international stage, which is a, a real shame because his moustache definitely deserved to be seen worldwide. So, without the international recognition, clearly this is his crowning moment. So all we want to know is when this picture of Claudio Torello was taken. How old was he? Simple as that. Answer to be revealed later on in the show. Now, I promised you three brand new features. So, Feature Claxon, brand new feature number one. This is the road to Wembley. This will have a shiny new jingle soon. I'm putting it together. I didn't have time to do it. I'm not going to be honest. I'm not going to lie. But there will be a shiny new little jingle for this one coming soon. So the road to Wembley. We are going to start the major competitions, the FA Cup, the FA Vars, the FA Trophy, in the earliest possible round with one match. From that match, we will follow the winners to the next round. We will then follow the winners. That we will go all the way through to the final. So believe it or not, Saturday the 7th of August, when this goes out, it's the extra preliminary round of the preliminary round, easy for you to say, of the FA Cup. Yep, the FA Cup actually starts on Saturday the 7th of August, for those who don't know. So what we had to do was choose a game. So I have chosen the gents of Harborough Town FC and Rothwell's Rothwell Corinthians FC. I'm not going to lie, I chose Harborough because they're my local team. They're my nearest team to here. If all plays well, I might even go and watch the game. You never know. So, both teams play in the United Counties Premier League South. They've both kicked off their league campaigns in midweek. Harborough winning 4-0 against Obi Town, their nearest rivals. And Rothwell Corinthians went down to a 4-2 defeat at Bugbrook St. Michael's. So, the winners have got the carrot of a home tie in the preliminary round against Biggleswade. So, who will come out on top? Will it be the boys from Market Harborough? Will it be the boys from Rothwell? We're going to put a little poll on Twitter. So you vote who you think will win. We'll have a bit of fun with it as well. Put in your comments below who's coming out on top, Harborough or Rothwell. Who do you want to win, Harborough or Rothwell? Remember, whoever wins, that's who we're backing in the next round. Simple as that. Whichever one of them wins, they're our team in the next round of the FA Cup. They only have to win 13 ties and they're at Wembley in the final. I realise that's a little far-fetched, and neither of those two clubs will be in the FA Cup final. Please don't bet on it. It would be very, very stupid. Um, for the FA Vars, we've chosen the game at Torpoint v Callington in the earliest possible round, so that's where we'll be heading for that one. And the FA Trophy, the game between Dunstan and Worksop. So all three cup competitions have had their ties chosen. So who knows? Your team could be involved at some stage. The dream is to get some guests on, to get some fans on at some stage of each of those clubs as we go through it. So quite simply, the road to Wembley, Wembley. We are beat the first man on the road to Wembley, Wembley. There we go. So. What? Another one, Reedy. Are you mad? Yes, new feature too. And this is where this bad boy comes into play. So, what time is it, do you think? I'll tell you what time it is. Hammer time! Yes, hammer time, ladies and gentlemen. So, what the hell is this idiot doing with an inflatable hammer, I hear you say? What is that idiot doing with an inflatable hammer? Well, let me tell you. So, we are going to celebrate a team being hammered. So, it doesn't get celebrated enough. Teams hand out hammerings, it just... Kind of, you know, other than the letters being printed after the score on like the vidi printer, etc. It just kind of, yeah, it's all a bit meh. So we're going to celebrate it. 
So the only rules are it's going to be in the pro game across the various countries. Can't be a, a, like a non-league game or anything like that or a, an amateur game. And um, that's really it. The only other thing is it has to be 6-0 or above. Nothing below 6-0. 5-0 is a beating, 6-0 is a hammering. So who is this week's hammer time? Well, let me tell you. We are heading to Austrian second division side Amstetten. So, last weekend they travelled to Dornburn for a league match, beautifully pronounced, and they ran riot. It started well with a Krinich own goal opening the scoring in the first minute, 1-0 up already after one minute. Further goals from Mustecic and Fredriksson made it 3-0 at the interval, 3-0 at half-time. Dernbin's day got worse, or Merovic saw red on the hour, 3-0 down, down to 10 men, and that is where the boys from Amstetten stepped up. There's two goals from Payam, and his first name's David, uh, and, and it's Austrian. Um, and one from Schnellniger meant they ran out 6-0 winners on the road. So, how do we celebrate this? I'll tell you how we celebrate this. The chair is Dornburn. The hammer is Amstetten. So, hammer time! One, two, three, four, five, six. Amstetten, the first winners of hammer time. Come on, that is good, isn't it, eh? You've got to admit, you love it. Anyway, this isn't a new feature. It's everyone's favourite bear. All right, Ted, how are we, mate? Marvellous, Reedy, although I haven't forgotten your stupid week off, silly games. Ted, let it go, my friend. You had a week off. The band are back together now, me and you. Anyway, what have you been doing? I've been watching the Olympics, Reedy. Some of it's good, some of it is utter dog shit. Ted, we're talking about Olympians here. People who, you know, they've trained in their art for years, the pinnacle of the career, four, five years in this occasion, to get to the Olympics and be the creme de la creme. And you've just described some of it as utter dog shit. Reedy, have you seen the dancing horses? That is not a sport. It takes skill and precision to... Oh, I can't lie, Ted, it's not a sport. Dressage is not a sport. It's just dancing horses. And let's be honest, how do we know which is a good dancing horse or which is a bad dancing horse? Now, if it was dancing blokes in a nightclub, that would be a sport. That would be very entertaining. Really, that would be brilliant. I know, I could enter. I could, I could be a winner of the shit one, yeah? Of the shit one, yes, you're quite correct. Um, now, I'm not going to lie, Ted... What do you think about the skateboarding? The skateboarding's awesome. Exactly. Now, the skateboarding is immense. I've loved the skateboarding. Who hasn't enjoyed the skateboarding? And you could get all the chavs off of all the estates, give them a skateboard, tell them to go and practice with a promise of the Olympics. Ted, that's just rude. It's, you can't just stereotype people like that. Give them a skateboard. I'm telling you now. They can all be at the Olympics. Okay, anyway... What else have you been enjoying, Ted, in the Olympics? Beer pong. Beer pong. Beer pong is not in the Olympics, Ted. Absolutely ridiculous. It has been in my house. Might not be an Olympic sport. And I'm pretty good at it. How can you be good at it? You've got no hands. It is more difficult with paws. I can't lie. I would have thought it is, Ted. Anyway, after all of this, have you managed to actually find us, with no football going on, a little knob of the week? Really, to be honest, this one comes under the category of big f off knob of the week. Ooh, that's not good. For those of you new to the show, this is the little knob of the week. So it's not it's not a penis, it's a little knob. Um, so Ted, uh, what, what on earth has done to win this huge, the, the huge one you're going to award, but it will be the little one. Um, who's won it? It's another collective, Reedy. Oh, not another collective. I, I've got a feeling I know who it is. Are you ready for me to call them out? Go for it. Call them out. Juventus Ladies Football Club. Oh, yes. Juventus Ladies Football Club. I've ranted on it about racist abuse from fans. Racist shit from fans. Racism in general. And then the twats at Juventus Ladies Football Club post this. Yeah, they posted that on Twitter. They thought it was banter. Yeah, it's not really, is it? It's just racism. It's just cheap, dirty race, just not necessary. Just rubbish. It's not even funny. It's pathetic. 
and they gave some real weak apology saying it um they they made a post which um they decided uh what was it let me just get the word in here um they they, they so, uh, it was a post dinner that had racial um i can't remember the word they used anyway racial undertones sorry and it wasn't racial undertones it was just racist it's just ridiculous you completely forgot what you were going to say then didn't you I did, Ted. I was angry and I didn't know how to go with it. So let's just cut to the chase. Juventus Ladies FC and your social media team, whoever posted it, you can apologise all you like. You are Ted's massive, giant knobs of the week, but you get the little knob of the week award. First one of the season, Ted. So we'll see you later for the old, how old the reveal, yeah? Yeah, I'm off to watch the Olympic knitting now. It's just about to start. Oh, God, he's not changed then, has he? Anyway, zooming in, one thing that we have kept. So this week on Zooming In, I was joined by solo artist and Tottenham fan, Mr. Jay Tennant, as we discovered his music, his love of Tottenham Football Club, and of course, we let him pick his ultimate five-a-side team. Listen out for his musical collaboration, either or question. He was clearly torn. But it's very interesting to see which way he went. Um, at the end of the chat, there will be a clip of Jay's current single, Sparks. Um, so oh, what can I say? Sit back and enjoy. Zooming in with Jay Tennant. Yeah. I'm delighted to say for our 50th episode, we are joined by solo artist and Tottenham fan, Mr. Jay Tennant. Jay, how are you this evening, my friend? I'm all right, thanks. How are you? You all right? Yes, not too bad at all. What an honour for you to be on the 50th show. You must be delighted. Yeah, I didn't realise that, actually. Uh, I'm loving that, to be honest. Yeah, I feel like a special guest or something. So, a nice one, yeah. You're officially a special guest because you're on number 50. God knows, him. I'm pushing for Liam Gallagher for 100, but I can't see I'm going to be able to talk him into it. He's not even replying. You never know. <laughs> say never. So, Jay, so just to start with, obviously there will be people out there who haven't heard of your music, don't know about you, what you're about. So... The sales floor is your, my friend. Tell us all about your music, what you're about, where you're from, how you started. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm from Birmingham originally, and uh, I've been doing music probably like most of my life in some way, like shape or form. Uh, but like I started off in bands and um, did bands for about 10 years. And then I've gone solo in the last sort of six years or something. So um yeah but I, i've done so far i've done two albums i'm working on a third album a string of singles as well um and uh it's all on spotify itunes all, all those places and uh yeah so uh, if people want to check it out it's jay tennant everywhere on social media really so uh <laughs> there you go yeah you're an active bunny on social media i'll give you that I try to be yeah i think uh i think you have to be a little bit like you've got to kind of maintain your presence a little bit and uh or people forget about you so uh and also i uh, try and like keep the the tunes flowing so yeah. try and record as regularly as i can and uh just keep them going really and it's good for me as well like to sort of push myself with the tunes so uh yeah yeah so i've been literally i've been absolutely hammering your latest single sparks to death in the car on the way home uh and amazing over the days because i like to always listen and give give stuff a listen I, I love it. It, it. I think it's very, I said to you before we came on air, for me, it's got a bit of an air of Shed 7 about it. I think anyone that lo likes Shed 7 will love a lot of your stuff. Um, who, I'll take that. Yeah. Who, who, who sort of are your inspirations or who, have you, who do you, you know, who, if you had to compare yourself to somebody, who would you compare yourself to? Um, so I'll start off by saying um, I, I try and like stay away a little bit from talking about influences too much because um I think people can can sort of get sort of too you can get too tied to to an influence if you like. Um, so I try and keep it sort of pretty open. But um, you've mentioned Shed Seven, and um, I did sort of grow up with the Britpop scene. Um, so a lot of those bands, like just big melodies, big songs, you know, um, your classic Verve, Oasis, all those guys. Also like Suede and the Manics and people like that. Um, sort of anthemic kind of tunes, you know, uh, big guitars, big choruses and that. So, so yeah, I definitely grew up with that and that's kind of stayed with me a bit. Um, but I think like the older I've got, I've, I kind of keep dipping back further to stuff that I'm like, was too young to sort of get into. So you go back to like the 80s, 70s, 60s and there, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of working through the 60s at the moment. So it's all good. So there'll be a Herman's Hermits cover coming up at some time soon. Uh, maybe yeah you, yeah don't rule it out yeah. 
<laughs> but I can't believe that was the first 60s band that came to mind. Of all the bands, the 60s, that was the first one that came to mind. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> so having never released any sort of musical song in my life, and, you know, all I can compare it to is, is releasing an episode of this and thinking, God, how will people take it? What is it like releasing a single? Because obviously you you will, will think it's good. You you clearly will think I've done something magical here. People are going to love this. But when you press that button that says go, how nerve wracking is that? Uh, those first few days afterwards. Yeah, um, do you know what? It, it's quite a big deal actually because um, you spend so long writing the songs and like you know crafting it and uh, trying to make sure that it, you know it's everything that you want it to be and uh, obviously recording it and stuff. And um, there's all those hours you put into it and then like sort of doing the artwork. If you, a lot of it's DIY for a lot of us guys now. So you kind of try and do as much of it as you can. And um, yeah, you put all this time into it. And then, like you say, it, it is a big deal and you, you want people to love it. And um, I mean, I've been lucky, like especially the last sort of nine months or so, uh, support's been amazing on like Twitter and stuff. And um, so like, you know, without those guys, you're nothing really. So it, it makes a massive difference. Like those first few days, like you say, people are, are getting into the tunes and, and sharing them and stuff. Um, yeah, it's a massive buzz. But like you say, with that comes a little bit of the stress of like, you know, <laughs> is it going to go down well and stuff? So, yeah, you've, you've always got to think about that. Yeah. It's weird isn't it? For, with, with Twitter. I mean, Twitter in particular for the for the musical guys, Twitter seems to be an absolute haven of, of you know, real support for each other. And, you you know, I put out here, you were coming on and straight away, two guys, two other musical guys come on and say, oh, brilliant, you know, I love it. Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there, there's a real togetherness. Flick it to football, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's the yeah, yeah. opposite. It's like you couldn't be two more poles apart, yet the two are so intertwined, music and football. It's weird that there's that real, you know, it's, it, like how different it is. It's just bizarre. Yeah, you're right. Um, and I think, in a way, that is probably a bit more of a modern thing with the music. Like, because I think with social media, like, um, I think if you think back to the 90s, there was probably quite a lot of ri like rivalry between um, between bands, obviously, like Blur and Oasis and all that, and uh, but other bands as well, and um, would sort of get caught up in it. But I think like nowadays, and especially with like the, the independent scene, um, I think you just realise that we're all in it together and, um, and like helping each other out is a good thing. And like, you never know, like, you know, that guy that you've, helped out whatever he might give you a gig at some point or whatever so yeah. it's it's about working together you know and uh, you, you might end up working with them musically at some point you never know so I think it's all good but yeah like you say um football definitely is it's massive uh, ro like rivalry isn't it like it's still going on now like more than ever I think so in a way like with social media that's gone the opposite it's even more like sort of and um, us and them, if you like, between teams and like supporters and stuff. So, yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's bizarre. But um, so I know you've got a um a pretty big because I have been doing a bit of Twitter stalking. Um, I know you've got a pretty big month coming up. So you're working on new songs. You've got a big gig in Coventry coming up as well, I believe. So yes, it, mate, yeah. You know, so obviously, as things ease with in terms of the COVID restrictions and the lockdown. How good is this to have so much going on and so much that you can do again that you couldn't do for the last year? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's been such a weird year, like for everyone, and uh, with like you know gigs being off off the agenda and stuff. And um, it does seem like now everyone's like buzzing to be back doing gigs again and uh, doing more things that you couldn't do before. Like for me, uh, I couldn't get to the studio for so long because of yeah. the restrictions, and uh, I record in Leicester and. Um, that was like the worst hit city in the country, it seemed like for so long. And uh, I luckily I had like some tunes saved up that I could sort of keep the music going a bit. But without that, I would have been doing nothing for like nine months, really. So apart from like writing the odd song. So, yeah, that was tough. But like you say, um, buzzing that now things are opening up again. Uh, big month, like you say. So, yeah, on the 29th um, of August, I've got the... Uh, the HMB Empire supporting the Institute's uh, big gig. There's about like six acts on the bill, I think. So I'm like buzzing to be part of that. So can't wait. Yeah. 
That sounds good. And uh, yeah, you don't have to tell me about Leicester man living living on the outskirts of Leicester. I know exactly how it's been here. It's been uh, it's been pretty tough, it's fair to say. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine, mate. Yeah, definitely. Feel for you. So I liked this is my new my new thing that I discovered over the last few weeks. So you can collaborate with one artist. You can only pick one. Who would you collaborate with, given the choice? Okay, um, I'm going to say Johnny Marr because um, he's an absolute amazing guitarist and a legend as well. And he seems like a really nice guy. And uh, he's worked on records like that I love, obviously with the Smiths, but also like electronic and then he's doing his solo stuff now and he's he's produced other bands like haven and marion like that i listened to back in the day and stuff so um i'm gonna say johnny Marr. like that would be phenomenal um, so it probably never happened but yeah i would love that well here's the test of your musical love so johnny Marr agrees to collaborate but the day after, that's it. You're not allowed to record. You're not allowed to perform. That's it. You end your musical career. Or no Johnny Marr, but you carry on going for as long as you like. Oh, that's that's tough. That's a, it's a big question. Um, do you know what? I, I, I don't want to be the one to turn down Johnny Marr, but I, I would probably say I'd rather keep doing the music like forever or whatever, you know, as long as I can and, uh, and the gigs and stuff. So... Uh, that's probably more important to me, like personally on a personal level. But I, I can't believe I've just said that because it's Johnny Marr. <laughs> you know I mean? Johnny, for some strange reason you're watching, he doesn't mean it. It's only a hypothetical question. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> See you next year, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one band, so one band so far who said that if they could collaborate, I can't remember. I think it was. I think it was Kurt Cobain, which obviously is never going to happen, but I think they said that if they could collaborate, that's it. Band's done. Folded. End of. <laughs> but, but, what uh, a way to go out, though. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> so we move on to your football and your love of uh, Tottenham Hotspur. Now, yeah, sure, yeah. I'm not gonna, <laughs> we have poked a little bit of fun at Tottenham on this show over, uh, over the last few months, mainly oh. around the whole Super League thing. So, Oh, yeah. So what was your, so this is one question I've not actually asked a Tottenham fan since it all broke. So what was your initial reaction when you heard the news? First of all, that there was going to be this European Super League. And secondly, that Tottenham were going to be in it. Uh, do you know what? Like, yeah, straight away, it was like, this is a really bad idea. Like, come on, just, just drop this straight away. And um, it was such a weird, like, I don't know if it was like, over a week or something was it or 10 days yeah. and like i think it was about 72 hours but it like broke on a sunday i think by the wednesday or thursday it, it died because i think the, the outpour uh, of <laughs> anger i think as a spurs fan it was a classic thing where you're sitting back watching right okay chelsea have pulled out man city have pulled out man united have pulled out <laughs> and i knew like spurs would be the last one to pull out because <laughs> uh, he loves his money, doesn't he? I think the uh, the chairman. So it, it, he was going to be in for that big time if if it was going to be a payday. I think so. Yeah, that yeah. was my that bit of it though. Just come on, you're embarrassing yourself. Come on, out we go. Yeah, surely. But yeah, he took his time over it. I think the only saving grace for those six clubs is that there was no fans in the ground at the time. I think that the host. I mean, the hostility was bad enough anyway. But if there'd have been fans in the ground at the time when the games were going on. Oh my God! It just <laughs> don't bear thinking about it. I think the, yeah. the problem is this, those six clubs have now almost set themselves up for this season. When fans are back, everyone's going to want to beat them to prove a point because the whole Super League Six thing, dead or not, everyone is now out to beat them. Um, which yeah, definitely. is you know it's unfortunately they, they're going to reap a little bit of what they sowed. Sadly, um, so Harry Kane. So yeah. will he, won't he? Do you care? Would you rather he just went and gone with it? And... Uh, what? Like, I was always a big Spurs fan, and like, I still follow them, but I'm a bit less sort of caught up in it than I was. But obviously, I've watched him like his time at Spurs. He's been phenomenal season. Like every season, has been amazing. Like I think he's won. Has he won the Golden Boot the last three seasons or something like that? And then, um, I like that. Yeah, yeah. we're. At, I think we're at a point now where he's 28 and it, if he's going to go at any time, you'd, you'd probably say it's got to be now. And um, I would say fair play, to be honest. He's been amazing for us. 
it's his time to go and win a trophy. And he, being realistic, he's not going to do that at Spurs because the uh, the chairman and the owner they just don't put the money in to to try and compete. So I I, I would not like begrudge him going now to be honest. Um, but it, obviously. Yeah, it's like rumours he hasn't turned up for training and all this. So that's going to rumble on a bit now, isn't it? And it's it's yeah. going to be on until, until the season starts. I think he might... I don't know. Do you think he'll go or do you think he'll stay? I'm not, I'm not sure at the moment. I can see him starting the season at Tottenham. Uh, I'm not sure I can see him seeing out the end of the window at Tottenham. I, I think... Yeah. I think- I think there's almost a bit of an inevitable, like you said yourself. He, the reality is, he's got he's reached an age probably where he, start, he wants to start winning things. He wants to be playing in the Champions League year in year out. I think yeah. you're right. He's been very loyal to you. He's been a great servant for you. For me, if I were a Tottenham fan, I'd be thinking, well, he's going to go. Let's just get the top dollar that we can get for him, which is probably now. Um, I think any longer yeah. than now, his value is going to start dropping. Um, uh, the problem is, it's, it's, it's finding someone to replace him. It's easy to say, take the 100 million or 160 million, whatever it is, but you've got to find someone to fill his boots. And that's not easy, is it? It's, that's the difficulty. No, you're spot on. And, um, and we have been here before with Bale and um, look how that turned out. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they bought like seven players. Like one of them was Ericsson, who has was, been amazing. But the other, the other lads, it just never really works out for any of them. Uh, I think we had Lamella for like 10 years and, He's gone now, but and he he did all right, but he never really played a lot. So um yeah, we, we really blew that money in a you know bad way. So um I I don't know who would you get? Yeah, no idea really. No, um difficult one. Very you've got to, I don't know, you've got to find some prospects again, haven't you? He's like twenty one or something and just banging in the goal somewhere. But um I I'm not sure who, who I'd get. No. At the moment, yes, it's just no. oh, cool. So, uh, without upsetting your mate Sam Lambeth, who's obviously a big Wolves fan, as we know. So, the appointment of Nuno, are we happy or are we uh, are we not happy? He's got it. Um, <laughs> you see, um, so I've not really followed Wolves that much. Sorry, Sam, but um, <laughs> like I, I hear he did really well there. I think, um, so I think it was quite quite popular. So. And um, I don't know, I think, like, I knew that we were going to go for somebody who wasn't that big a name, probably, after it's, it's not really panned out with Mourinho. And um, it, it felt like he was going to go for a bit of a Pochettino-style appointment. And I think he has done that uh, yeah. with Nuno. I, I think I'm all right with it, to be honest. Like, I, I hear it here that his team's played good football and stuff. So um, I'm looking forward to that because the time under Mourinho got <laughs> painful watching sometimes but that's what you get isn't it so uh, we knew that when he came and I was never really up for him being on board from from day one really but you sort of think well if he wins a trophy I'll take it like after all the years of not winning a trophy but yeah I'm happy with Nuno I think so let's let's see what he can do but I just hope he gets a bit like a bit of backing in the transfer market and then I think we just signed this Romero guy for 50 million or something who's supposed to then a back, I think it was like star player in the Italian league or something. So I'll take that as a, a, a decent sort of sign that we might support him. So yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. So this is the either or question. It's, it's never easy. It's always horrible. It's a little bit like the music collaboration, but based on the football. So yeah, yeah. the FA Cup or the League Cup, but Arsenal win the league or mid-table mediocrity but you finish above Arsenal and you beat them twice. Okay. That's a tough question, man. You've thought... <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a rotten question. I know. Uh, the Celtic I... Boys, I asked the Celtic boys a similar question with Rangers. Now, knowing what the hatred is between them two, you can imagine how that went. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I bet they went for finishing above Rangers, didn't they? Probably. Two of them went for winning the league and losing four times to Rangers. One of them went, nah, fuck that. He said, beat Rangers and finish second. He said, I'm not having it. I'm not having them beat us four times. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what? Like, I know a lot of Spurs fans would say, uh, got to finish above Arsenal, whatever. Like, that's, that's the target for the season. But you're saying we win either the FA Cup or the League Cup? Either the FA Cup or the League Cup, but they win the league in the same year. I'm going to take the trophy. Uh, I don't know if that's controversial. Probably is, but um, 
I've, it's been so long since Spurs won a trophy. So, um, and, I, and I think that would probably mean more to the, most of the fan base than Arsenal winning the league. And OK, <laughs> if you lose to him, whatever, like there's always next season, I think. But to get that trophy, like when was the last one? It's like 12 years ago or something. I can't even remember. So 2008 or something, wasn't it? So it's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah, no, not me. I'd be all over that. Taking a, I'd take a trophy every time and suffer the little bit of pain of your uh, of your opponents winning something. Because it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not the biggest of pain, is it? No, tactical trophy. I think we'll take we'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, your favourite ever Tottenham player? Not necessarily the best, just your favourite ever player. Um, so I'm going to show my age a bit, but. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in the 80s and um, like my first like hero at Spurs was Glenn Hoddle and uh, watching him was was amazing. Yeah. But he was there for about a season and then he'd gone to France uh, and I was sort of still growing up. So I'd probably say Chris Waddle, I think, because I watched him like for the next few seasons and uh, he was amazing. And um, so probably going to have to be him, I think. And uh, do you want to get a musical review on the pair of them together? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Diamond Lights. What a, what a tune! What a what tune! A, what a, it was even better, but no one's ever heard it. Um, no. <laughs> I, think, I think as your uh, your penance, you should uh, put both of those out on Twitter tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'll do a cover of them at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, right, so Jay, the bit that all the musicians love, you get to turn into your football manager for the day, so you get to pick your five-a-side team. The only rule was quite simple, you have to have seen them play live and in the flesh. One goalkeeper, yeah. one defender, two midfielders, one striker. As you're a solo artist, you get the joy of picking your own team and not having to argue with any band mates. So uh, let's fire off with your, uh, with your goalkeeper, my friend. I like it. Um, <laughs> well... <laughs> It's a little bit tricky because I haven't been to that many matches in my time, actually. Um, I've probably only been to about 30 games or whatever, ever, like, which is shocking. But um, I'm going to say goalkeeper Ian Walker. Yeah. Um, bit of a surprise choice, probably. But I've seen him for Spurs and I've seen him for Leicester as well, I think. So, uh, and uh, I've got a story about meeting him outside a nightclub in Leicester as well. So, <laughs> kind of exciting. But I remember being like we'd been to like an indie night somewhere, and then um, that closes at two a.m. And then you're like, "Well, the night's still young. Where should we go?" Yeah. And um, the towny nightclubs were always going on another hour or something, so uh, we wandered over to sort of to like that sort of area, that part of town. And um, Ian Walker was standing outside a bar, so I had a chat with him about Spurs days and whatnot. So. Uh, Bit of a star moment, yeah. <laughs> and the thing with Ian Walker, one thing I could never ever work out: how did he keep his hair so slicked back, even when he was playing, <laughs> even when it was pissing down the rain? It didn't matter; it never moved. It was incredible. He yeah, had- you're right. He must have uh, gelled it or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to rely on you for the hair um, products information. My friend, I've got nothing here to, to offer. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <Jared>. <laughs> <laughs> um, So you're defender in front of Mr. Walker, then? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go for Gary Mabbott, who was a bit of a bit of a Spurs legend, I think, and um, bit of an unsung hero. Um, he did lift the FA Cup for us in '91, and um, love him for that. And uh, yeah, he was he was a great defender, always put in a hard shift, and. Um, and I think it's like really top bloke as well. And um, I think he's been like bringing people during lockdown, yeah. like fa- elderly fans and whatnot to sort of help them out and stuff. So uh, yeah, good guy. And uh, and two things with Gary, obviously famously played with diabetes for his whole career, um, which is just incredible yeah. pro footballer playing with diabetes. And uh, you're right, he's one of the nicest people. I met him, we had him at a sportsman's dinner at my old local football club many years ago. Oh. Genuinely one of the nicest people you could ever wish to meet. Uh, he really, really was a genuinely nice fella. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yes, so Gary Mabbott alongside Ian Walker. So, first of your midfielders then. Um, so, I'm going to go for the flamboyant David Ginola, oh. uh, if you remember him. What a, what a beautiful man. The, the Brits would say. <laughs> um, yeah, so, 
depth for Spurs. And um, yeah, great player, like great skill, like sort of skin a few defenders down the wing and then whip a great cross in or scored a few worldies as well in his time. So uh, I'll definitely go for him as one of the midfielders, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of women wanted to be with him and a lot of blokes wanted to be like him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was just... I mean, he, he's, he, was a, he still is a beautiful man. Let's be honest. He is a, he's an incredibly handsome chap, <laughs> but a bloody good footballer as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and I, he was on Talk Sport. Um, I don't know if he still is, but I used to listen to him a bit on that as well. And uh, yeah. yeah, he took took sense a bit, I think. So yeah, he's, good goal. And he's another one I would say that even if you don't support Tottenham or Newcastle, obviously where he was famous for that as well. I think you, you kind of like him. He's one of those players that you like, uh, no matter who he plays for. He's just, again, comes across as a really nice bloke. Yeah, popular guy. Yeah, that's it. He seems to always have a bit of a sense of humour and a uh, great player as well, like to watch as well. Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. You're, you're going for a nice bloke by the side team here. That's, I mean, that's three quite nice blokes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, who you got alongside young David then? Um. I'm going to go for Darren Anderson, uh, who was like him and Sheringham were amazing together. Um, that always sticks in the memory, like the old Anderson Sheringham corner routine, like whip it in and Sheringham would nod it in or whatever. But yeah, he was he was a great creative player as well. Again, I think underrated a bit, and um, he did quite well for England in the end, and like scored in the World Cup and stuff. Um, but yeah, like just good technical passer of the ball, great crosser, like. Could, put it on a sixpence so uh, I'm going to go for him yeah yeah I think and he's, he's one who's definitely I think he's very unlucky because he got a reputation of being sick no didn't he and always being injured but actually I don't know how much of that is actually I don't know how many games he actually missed through injury I don't no bit of a, a bit of a red herring I think like he got a lot of stick for that but he played a lot more than Jamie Redknapp uh, funnily enough <laughs> yeah. who never never gets a mention for being out but he was yeah Anderton's got he's got the most appearances for Spurs still like the Premier League record so right. that showed how much he played and um, yeah I think it was unfair I think um, I think the physio was a bit dodgy at the time or something so he did miss some games but I don't think it was as bad as people used to make out yeah no I, I don't think so I think like you say definite definite red herring or an urban myth whichever way we want to go with it yeah. so there's, a, there's some serious cre- creativity in that midfield so who we got up front who's just going to literally stand there and take all the glory yeah, so I thought about Les Ferdinand, uh, big Les, because he was he was a, a quality striker, uh, like every club he was at. But um, I'm going to stick with Waddle because, like, in his last season for Spurs, they they played him as number nine, and he played up front on his own, and he um, was banging the goals in. I think he scored he scored like 15 or something for the season, and then some more in the cup or whatever. But yeah, he was phenomenal that season, and then obviously in the Spurs tradition. Sold him off for uh, <laughs> me. so we never and they could play together, like which is a shame. But Gaza was there, uh, should have picked Gaza, shouldn't I? Yeah, you could have had Gaza, yeah, yeah, could have had Gaza. Uh, never mind. Um, I'll <laughs> take it. No, I, I can't disagree. I mean, think with Chrissy Wadder, it's a bit of a weird one. I think whether it's an English thing or a British thing that. He, he so much ability, masses of ability, a genuinely, naturally fantastic footballer. But he was one of those guys who would never really seemed to get the credit that he was due for the ability that he had. His people seemed yeah. to like him and John Barnes. John Barnes was another one. I thought, you know, he's a great footballer. But people always just gone about the fact that, you know, they, they didn't do this or they didn't do that or they didn't track back. So what? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I think you're right on both of them. And, uh, I think it was that sort of 80s, 90s thing of, of like, it changed in the 90s a bit, but they were both sort of flair players, weren't they, really? Like, who dribble past players and then put a cross in and um, or score a great free kick or whatever. And, like, at the time, we didn't really appreciate that enough, I don't think, in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Like, Hoddle was way underappreciated for what he did. Like, phenomenal player. If he'd been, like, Argentinian or something, he'd have been hailed as one of the greats, I think. And... Um, yeah, it's just a bit of an English thing, I think. Like you say, just um, and they were both quite humble, I think. So um, I don't know if you're a bit more of a on the star man, you get noticed a bit more. But they were both quite sort of quiet in a way, I think. Uh, but but great on a football pitch. So uh, yeah, it's a good shout. Yeah, no, 
Jay, that's been fantastic, my friend. So as we said earlier, your latest single, Sparks, is out to download download now. There will be a clip of it afterwards after we finish this chat. Um, you can find the link on Jay's Twitter or my Twitter. It'll be on there as well. Um, 29th, you're playing in Coventry. Tickets still available? Yes, mate. I mean, they're going faster here, but uh, there are some available. And it's the uh, it's a bank holiday weekend, so no work on the Monday. So... It's a Sunday night, good excuse to just go and have a few and see some great, great live, live music, great bands. So, uh, yeah, do it. Sounds good to me. So, from now, from me, Reedy, from Jay, Jay, thank you so much, my friend. It is uh, back to the show. Top man, Mark. Absolutely smashing bloke, and he does write some top tunes. Well, he's got two albums on there that you can go and listen to and download. His current single, Sparks, that you just heard. So, why not head on over to Spotify or Twitter, hunt him down, and give him his tunes a listen because he was a genuinely really nice fella. And he's been so so nice about the show and me on anything I've put on social media. So, please do me a favor, go and download his tunes if you do nothing else this weekend. As I said. Next week, we will be joined by Stoke Gabriel and Torbay Police Chairman Gary Page, a.k.a. Mid-Table Gary. If you've got any questions for Mid-Table Gary, such as how the hell were you going to finish Mid-Table, um, put them in the comments below. Send them in to me on Twitter. Let's get some questions for Gary. Uh, we'll have a bit of fun as well. He, he's a he, top man. He, he's taking it all in, uh, in good heart. But... Uh, What's that coming over the hill? The name game. Yes, still the only part of the show with its own jingle. Not for long, there's another one coming. Um, the name game, the uh, beautiful part of the show where we go around the world looking for brilliantly named footballers and I bring them to you for your entertainment. So this week we head to Germany and a man who made, showed tremendous loyal to his club. He made 222 appearances for Dynamo Dresden um, in the old East Germany over an 11, peri 11 year period. He also won 38 caps for his country um, for, for East Germany, which shows you the kind of calibre of player we're talking about. His next nat natural step from there when he retired, of course, was coaching and it was Dynamo Dresden where he's cut his teeth before he moved on to Germany, the unified Germany, under 20s and under 21s as a coach, between 20, 2006 and 2011. So his calibre as a player and a coach remains without question. What we want to know, though, does his name reach that calibre? Oh boy, yes it does. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the wonderfully named Ralph Minge. Now, you know what I'm going to say. There will be no photo of a minge for a cheap gag. I'm sorry, you're not getting a close-up picture of a minge on your TV screen. So if you're looking for that, you've come to the wrong channel. Perhaps you should disappear to another type of website. Maybe Google it. Actually, maybe don't. <laughs> um, so here's Ralph Minge. There we go. It's a great name. You've got you to admit it. It's a top name. So it'll be a comeback next week for another one. But what is that? Another one? Yes, new feature three. So to be fair, this one's a bit more of a trailer than actually a new feature. So following on from Guess V Knowledge last season and Dad V Lad the Euros, this season it's a little bit of a change. It's Dad V Lad Fantasy Football. So quite simply, me and Kian will go head to head in fantasy football for the season. 
We'll lose to choose our team each week. We'll be on here each week, giving us giving out our teams, any transfers we've made, how we scored the previous week, um, and putting it on there. What we'll also be doing, we will be setting up a league for the Beat the First Man Fantasy League. So if you do fantasy football, please enter the league. It'll be free. I might put up a little prize for the end of the season just for a laugh. Um, but please enter. Just come on board, have a bit of fun. I might even invite some of you on one week just to talk about your team, just to change it up a little bit. But Dad V Lad, Fantasy Football is your third new feature. I can't believe I've given you three in one week. I told you I was going away for a week's break and I was coming back bigger and better. Hopefully you can see we are coming back bigger and better. Got to work on a few bits, I'm not going to lie. If I could get some really clever person to do all the jingles and stuff. Hello? Hello? Anybody there? Um, so, guess what else is back this week? The Lineal European Cups. So, you may remember last season we had the Lineal European Cup and the Lineal UEFA Cup. Quite simply, if you didn't watch it when we were doing it last year, it's winner stays on. So, whoever holds the trophy, if they win or draw, they stay on, they retain the trophy. If they lose, whoever beats them gets the trophy. A bit like in boxing. So, in the Lineal European Cup, our current holders are Borussia Dortmund. Well, I can tell you on Saturday... They travel to Wien Wiesbaden of the third division. Can the Minnows produce a massive shock and become the lineal European Cup holders? It would be huge if they did it. Remember, a draw is enough for Dortmund. So keep an eye on that game over the weekend and see who runs out lineal European Cup holders. Now, you may remember the lineal UEFA Cup we had a little bit of fun with as the season went on. We decided to have a little bit of a play with the names and make it a bit jokey. So... Our current holders are Susanna Hoffenheim of Bundesliga and the Bengals fame. Now, Susanna Hoffenheim, they are in action on Monday night in the Cup. and They too are on the road. They travel to Victoria Köln 1904. So, let me get this right. Susanna Hoffenheim of the Bengals are playing on a manic Monday. This shit writes itself. Easy. So keep an eye out on the social media channels to see who retains the trophy, who loses the trophy, who wins the trophy. Remember, anyone can win it. If it goes into European competition and they lose to an English team, it comes over here. You could have Chelsea holding it, drawing somebody in the Carabao, lose. It could be the older shot, could be the new holder. So anything could happen. So I think we've been waiting long enough to find out. So Ted is back. So it's time we cut to the chase for the reveal of how old. Reedy, please tell me the stupid public guesses haven't returned. No, Ted, the public have dropped off, so we'll have no guesses. They weren't stupid, so it's just down to you and your uh, wrong guesses. Um, excuse me. Well, again, I have studied hard, and this one is bloody ridiculous. It's stupid, so I'm just going to say 22. Hmm, OK. Well, let's find out. So when this photo of Claudio Torella was taken... He was 24 years old, not 22, 24, Ted. You were so close. Oh, piss off, really. I hate this stupid game. I bet your viewers do too. Putting up some picture of an old porn star from the 70s and asking him to guess how old he is. Ted, what's a porn star? Yeah, whatever, really. Stupid game. And Claudio Torella, you can piss off and all. Oh, somebody's tired. Oh, there we go. The beautiful Ted. If you've never seen him before, this is your first time watching. Anyway, so the end of the momentous episode 50 has arrived and it's been emotional. Well, it hasn't really, but that's what they all say on like things to programs and films and shit. It's been emotional. It hasn't been emotional in the slightest. If any of you have cried at this, well, well you might have cried, wasting some time. Cried with laughter, maybe. Who knows? Maybe you just cried thinking, God, this poor bloke, this is all he's got to do on a Friday night and a Saturday morning. Anyway, so I hope you love the new features. I hope you still like the old features. I hope you've enjoyed the show. If you are new to it, remember, please click the subscribe down below. Please give us the likes. Remember, we want 10. We want 10. And don't forget to ring the little bell so you never miss another show. But for now, though, in true catchphrase style, this will never change. It is... Ding, ding. Next stop, Saturday, the 14th of August, which will be the opening Saturday of the Premier League season. So for now, everybody, stay safe. See you next week.